While I was writing my last video, I collected a bit of information about former President Obama's house on the coast, because I was having an online discussion with someone. In the end, I decided it's not really worth debunking, because it didn't have much to do with science. But then it was brought up as an argument in several posts responding to that video. Not just Obama buying coastal property, but also Al Gore, Nancy Pelosi and Bill Gates. And it turns out this is also a big talking point on the blogosphere. So I'll treat this as a legitimate question. If sea levels are rising, why are people who accept the conclusions of oceanographers and climate scientists still buying beachfront property? Isn't it all going to be underwater? asked one poster. We'll start with Obama and this question from a guest blog on What's Up With That. Did Obama just buy a beachfront mansion? Rumours are flying that the owner of a beachfront mansion in Hawaii is none other than President Obama, the same president who warns us that global warming and rising sea levels are a greater danger to the future of America than Islamic terrorism. I can now confirm that this story was in fact true. There were rumours flying that Obama had bought a beachfront mansion in Hawaii. Unfortunately, the rumours turned out to be false. The property had been bought by the head of the Obama Foundation, Marty Nesbitt. But that didn't prevent the rumours from being upgraded to actual fact. However, while the Obamas didn't buy this oceanfront property, they did buy another oceanfront property at Martha's Vineyard. So attention was switched to that. The What's Up With That blog tried again. Sea level rise? Obama just bought a beachside property. Well, not quite. The property is at 79 Turkeyland Cove Road in Edgartown, Massachusetts, which is several hundred metres from the beach and about 10 feet above sea level. So if President Obama really does follow the science, as he professes to do, then he knows that storm surges aren't going to be an issue, and he knows that even at the extreme high end of estimates, scientific projections show that the property will be permanently inundated sometime after the year 2200, that's 180 years from now, by which time Barack and Michelle will be about 250 years old, and not that bothered. Al Gore also came in for some flack after buying this house right on the beach. Just a couple to three years after the Nobel Peace Prize, he and Tipper, well, tragically before their divorce, they went out and spent $9 million on a mansion on the oceanfront in California. One blogger wrote, Mr. Gore just paid nearly $9 million for the property, which, according to his professed beliefs, will likely soon be literally underwater, and hence worthless both as a residence and for resale. The blogger rules out the possibility that Al Gore is so dumb he'll buy a house he believes will be underwater likely soon, so that leaves only one possibility, he says that Mr. Gore is a self-conscious, witting liar who doesn't actually believe his predictions of doom. Of course, Al Gore may be a self-conscious, witting liar who doesn't actually believe his predictions of doom. Who knows? But there is a very obvious third possibility, which is, for you way ahead of me, that his house is in no danger from rising sea levels at all. For a start, this isn't his house. Al Gore's house is at 1504 East Mountain Drive, Montecito, in the hills overlooking the town and about 50 feet above sea level. So according to the scientific projections Al Gore professes to believe, his house should be underwater several hundred years after he's dead. I don't have an exact address for John Kerry's house, but it doesn't matter. Most of Chilmark, where he bought his house, is also comfortably more than 10 feet above sea level. So let's try Nancy Pelosi's house. According to an anonymous tweet, and if you can't trust anonymous tweets on the internet, who can you trust? Nancy bought this house. Clearly, it's right on the water. But sadly, it doesn't seem to belong to Nancy Pelosi. Her office and the real estate agency selling the house said she isn't the buyer. So unless someone has evidence other than a tweet, that claim is a non-starter. The strongest contender is a beach house owned by Bill Gates at 2808 Oceanfront, Del Mar, California. It's not his main residence, but it is only a few feet above sea level and right next to the beach. So Bill has only another hundred years or so to enjoy his beach house, 
Then, at the age of 160, he'll either have to buy another one or spend more time in his main residence or one of the dozen other mansions he owns. The more immediate problem for Bill is that long before the beach house gets inundated, he'll have to protect it against storm surges and coastal erosion. The engineering work doesn't come cheap, maybe upwards of a million dollars, so I hope he's got a bit of cash. In sum, according to the scientific projections, these wealthy people don't have much to worry about, regardless of their political affiliation or beliefs. There's no scientific evidence that sea levels will rise by several feet in the next few years, and as far as I know, none of them has made that claim. Certainly, there's no such claim made in the scientific literature. If you really believe that sea level rise is a problem, I will guarantee to buy that property for one dollar. Because after all, it's not worth anything to you. Well, what a surprise. No one wants to sell a house which will be snapped up on the market for millions of dollars for just a dollar. I wonder why. Once again, not a great argument against the science. In the end, it makes no difference to the science whether Al Gore and Barack Obama are wonderful people or the most disgusting creatures on Earth. Scientific facts are scientific facts, regardless And the fact that their houses are safely out of harm's way doesn't matter either. There are much more immediate problems to concern ourselves with than Al Gore's basement getting flooded a thousand years from now. So let's have a look at the more interesting question of why people buy beachfront properties that really are vulnerable. If it's so close to disaster, why is it that oceanfront mansions are selling better than ever? Record prices, record numbers. That's a very good question. And not just for property with a limited lifetime due to sea level rise, but also associated problems like subsidence, shifting sands and coastal erosion. Even in Miami, where many of the scientists say it's going to hit first and be worse there. Actually, I've heard that it's already happening. That's right, it is. Some buyers are now taking height above sea level into consideration, along with square footage and proximity to schools and stores when buying a house in South Florida. So are mortgage lenders and insurance companies. And that is having some effect on property prices. But that's only some buyers. What about the rest? This map of property prices shows that the most expensive areas, the darker green colours, are along the coast. Why? Well, obviously one reason is that living or retiring near the beach is a popular dream. So buyers over 40 aren't going to worry about what will happen to their property due to rising sea levels in 50 years' time. By then they'll be too old or too dead to care. And since only 73% of Americans believe the science anyway, the rest will be quite happy to buy coastal property, whatever the projections are. The buyers we need to look at are those who do accept the science and plan to sell their properties in 20 or 30 years or pass them on to their offspring they have a calculation to make. They know that in a hundred years, scientific projections show that the sea may be permanently covering the floor of a $400,000 house they want to buy. So they know that somewhere between their house being worth $400,000 now and nothing a hundred years from now, prices will have to stop rising at some point and start to fall. The problem is they don't know when that transition point will be. If they manage to sell before the decline begins, then they get to enjoy the beach lifestyle they want for a limited time and then sell at a healthy profit. But if they don't, then they risk being left holding a property few people want to buy in a falling market. There were some interesting experiments conducted along these lines by economist Vernon Smith in the 1980s, which showed this very starkly. Test subjects were given some money and told to trade imaginary shares. They were told the real value of each share would start at $3.60 and decline over time. So at the end of the game, any shares they had left would be worth just 24 cents. As an incentive to try as hard as they could to make a profit, they were allowed to keep whatever profit they made at the end of the experiment. To begin with, the shares were offered to them at a lower price than their actual value, usually around $2 a share, just like a real IPO, and then they started trading. Obviously, since the test subjects knew the shares were worth more than the $2 trading price, they started buying shares, and the trading price therefore moved upwards. 
Now, you would have thought that when the trading price met the actual value of the shares, people would want to cash in and sell. After all, they knew that from that point onwards, the value of their shares would decline. But they didn't. They kept on buying, and so the trading price kept going up. It seemed that regardless of fundamental value, the more prices went up, the more people wanted to buy. And the more they wanted to buy, the more the prices went up. Halfway through, they were trading shares way above their actual value, and they were getting closer to the end of the game where the shares would be almost worthless. It was only when some traders lost their nerve and decided to cash in their profits that the price curve flattened out. When others saw that prices were no longer going up, there was a scramble to get out of the market. The result was a classic asset bubble. And Vernon Smith got the same bubble with different groups of people, even experienced market traders. Think about the housing bubble. Buyers, sellers, borrowers, lenders, real estate agents, mm -hmm. government regulators, everybody believed that prices would, would rise and mm -hmm. continue to rise. And that is, is kind of the essence of right. one of these, uh, a, a, of a bubble. So substitute property prices for share prices, and we come back to the same puzzling question. Why don't buyers recognize the long-term reality? I don't have a Nobel Prize in economics, like Vernon Smith, so I'll let him give the answer when he was asked the same question during an interview. They don't recognize that the value is declining or they don't care. Well, let me just say right now that we don't understand why it is that people get caught up in self-reinforcing expectations of rising prices. So there it is. We can understand the physics of why sea levels are rising, and we can measure that rise, but we still don't understand why humans make irrational economic decisions. Of course, there'll be a thousand Nobel Prize candidates in the comments forum with a thousand different theories explaining it, and they'll all be right. But whatever the reason, it's not a good idea to bet that because people make irrational or emotional decisions in the marketplace, then science must be wrong. A hundred years before the sea covers low-lying parts of South Florida may seem like a long time. But long before we get permanent inundation, the storm surges and king tides that occasionally flood the region will become more regular and more destructive. So anyone planning to sell a house 25 years from now, the life of a typical mortgage, will be trying to sell to people who know that salt water will likely be invading their home dozens of times during the lifetime of their own mortgage. And the banks and insurance companies know that too. So more and more people are going to do what some forward-thinking buyers are already doing, way height above sea level into the value of the house and pay accordingly. And that point of hesitancy is the point at which the bubble starts to burst. Of course, you can say, that's no big deal. People will just move. And that's true. The economy can probably absorb the collapse of the vulnerable part of the Florida real estate market, which is worth about $8.7 trillion. But the problem is a lot bigger than a few million residential homes in suburban Florida. For a start, there's the infrastructure in coastal cities all over the world, which is a lot more expensive and a lot harder to move. On top of that, there are more immediate problems associated with climate change, such as water shortages for billions of people as glaciers disappear, or wildfires, salination, disappearing coral reefs and fisheries, droughts and floods. If you think mitigating these problems involves some kind of world communist government, Take a look at the video where I show what's being done to shift from fossil fuel energy to clean energy under the free enterprise system. You might be surprised. Before I go, I have to apologize to all those who say their posts aren't showing up or disappearing from the channel. Inevitably, there are accusations that I'm censoring criticism, which is clearly nonsense, as you can see by reading through the hundreds of critical comments on my channel. What's happening is that YouTube is automatically sending a lot of posts directly to spam, both critical and supportive, for reasons that I can't fathom. Here are some of them in the spam folder. See what you can find wrong with those. 
Consequently, I have to clear out the spam folder every now and again, but it takes a long time and it's a pretty thankless task. So if your post doesn't show up, it's a good idea to make a copy of your comment before you post it, and if it doesn't show up, try again, or complain to YouTube. If your post is a violation of my channel rules against advertising, racism and plagiarism, then let me know why you think those rules are unfair. And on another issue, I've been successful in getting this channel monetized, but I was unsuccessful in getting it monetized for the benefit of the charity that I support, Health in Harmony. YouTube doesn't allow the content creator to be in one country and the beneficiary in another. I could, of course, allow advertisements, name myself as the beneficiary and pass the money on, but that leaves me open to claims that I've monetized this channel for my own benefit. A number of people have tried to claim that I'm making these videos for financial gain or deliberately making clickbait, and as long as the channel isn't monetized for my own benefit, those claims are pretty easily rebuffed. So rather than lay myself open to charges of profiting, I'd rather continue to make these videos for free and ask that people donate to the charity listed in the video description. Knowing that I'm helping them do important work in saving lives and protecting forests is what keeps me going. The only exception is going to be the occasional educational video, so out of the hundreds of videos I've made, I have monetized one. This one and I'm planning to make another on how mountains are formed, and I'll monetize that one too. Everything else is free. So thanks to those who've contributed to the charity, raising around $200,000. And I hope you'll continue to be generous as you watch more videos.